Hey everyone, I just wanted to show my face. It's week three, so congratulations for making it this far. Um, I am just popping in to say hi and to give a little bit of an introduction to the next module. So in this module, we are going to focus on the influence that social relationships have on our health. So if you think back to the ecological model from week one. This is really um, focusing a lot at the interpersonal level, but you'll notice there are also some aspects of what you'll cover this week that will get into the community level as well. Um, so there's two lectures for this week's module. This first one really focuses on um, visualizing social relationships, how we do that in the social sciences, and how visualizing helps us understand um, the impact of social relationships on health. Um, and so the other reason that I wanted to pop in with a little video of me saying hi is also just to check in to make sure that everyone's doing okay and to let you know that um, I am here. I check my email all the time. So if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to... Um, let me know whether it's um, you know through Blackboard or via email or whatever. I try really hard to make sure that I get back to everybody in a timely manner. Um, so if anything's come up for you, you want to ask questions about the project, whatever the case may be, just send me an email and um, and we'll chat by email or whatever works. Uh, I just don't want you to be afraid to get in touch with me since it's not a face-to-face -face class. And also, if this is the first time maybe you've taken an online class, there might be some bumps in the road, so just reach, feel free to reach out to me. Um, so let's go ahead and jump into the first lecture, um, which looks at how social relationships influence our health. What are the mechanisms through which relationships matter for our health? I hope you enjoy this week. I think there's a lot of fun readings, and um, I really like the videos that I've chosen, so I hope that you do as well. All right, so the first part of this module's lecture, as I said, is going to focus on how we visualize social relationships. So at this point, we're sort of taking for granted that, that social relationships matter for health. Um, and I'll get into much more of how that works later. But for now, this part of the lecture is really going to focus on how we visualize what these relationships look like and how those visualizations can help us better understand health. When we talk about a social network, I'm not necessarily talking about Twitter or Facebook or Snapchat or something like that, although those are types of social networks and we could visualize those in much the same way that we visualize um, relationships like friendships or family or things like that. But, but in general, social, a social network is a set of relations or links or ties among social actors. Now, when I'm talking about social actors, typically we mean people, but we could also think about relationships between um, social organizations or countries or um, sort of larger scale collectives that are not people. Most of what we're going to be doing is going to be focusing on social actors as people. Okay, and so if we can draw what the social networks look like, then that helps us visualize social relationships, okay? And essentially, the study of um, social relationships and help, health helps us answer the question that Thompson poses in the article on happiness. To what extent are we autonomous individuals? Meaning, to what extent are we totally acting in a vacuum and doing things totally on our own? Right, you should know by now that the answer to that is probably going to be we are not autonomous, totally autonomous individuals. We can make our own decisions, but the social context has a big influence on what it is that we do. Okay, and so this module really gets at the second layer of the ecological model, um, the interpersonal layer, right? So social relationships are important for health, and the way that social relationships matter varies. Um, you can look at quantity, you could look at quality, you could look at the type of relationship, you could look at what we call the reciprocity of connections, meaning if I say that somebody is my friend, do they also say that I am their friend? We'll come back to this idea of reciprocal relationships in a minute. So let's just look at the basics of visualizing social relationships. So in 
network science or network research, when we do these visualizations, these network models, we have dots that we would call nodes. They have other names, but for now we'll call them nodes. Nodes are typically people, right? Or like I said, some other social actor. And if there's a relationship between those two people, you'll see a tie or a link or a path between them. So ties connect people. That blue tie represents a social relationship. Now, what exactly about that social relationship it represents depends on what the researcher is looking at. So it could mean lots of different things. It could mean that they're neighbors. It could mean that they take a class together. It could mean that they are friends. It could mean that they have a romantic relationship. They can really represent anything about a social relationship that you might want to study. Okay. Now, we can look at directed relationships. Okay. So you'll see that sometimes in some visualizations of social networks, there will be an arrow at one end or the other, maybe both. In this case, the arrow goes from person A to person B, which indicates that person A has said that they have a social relationship of some kind with person B. However, there is not an arrow going back to person A, which indicates that person B does not reciprocate the relationship. It's a one-sided relationship. But you could also have a reciprocal relationship where person A says that person B is someone they have a relationship with and person B says the same thing. So they're each identifying each other as someone they have some kind of social relationship with. Now sometimes you'll see ties like over here. You'll see ties where there are no arrows. And usually what that means is that each person was not asked to name their friends or whatever, or that the nature of the tie means that both people have to be involved in that relationship, right? So you can imagine a scenario where one pe person thinks that they're friends with somebody else, but that person does not think that they're friends with the other. But there are some scenarios where in order for the link to be there, both people have to be involved. And we'll get to an example of what that means or what that could look like in a minute. So this is um, a visualization of a romantic relationship network at a fictional high school called Jefferson High School. Okay, so this high school has, there are about 575 students, 10th through 12th grade, represented in this picture. So 575-ish students who indicated to the researchers that they either had a romantic relationship with somebody or a sexual relationship with somebody. So the nodes, right, which are different colors, blue and pink, which indicate gender or sex, the nodes are connected by ties, which indicate that those two people who are connected by that tie have either a romantic or a sexual relationship, right? And you'll notice that the ties do not have arrows because in order for two people to be in a sexual relationship, they are both participating in that relationship. That's kind of how that works. So in this case, you don't need arrows because if you're in a relationship with somebody, most of the time, right, and I understand there are some uh, examples or instances where rom in terms of romantic relationships that might not be the case, but for the most part, those are considered to be implicitly reciprocal, okay? So essentially, you've got a couple of different types of smaller networks within the larger high school network, okay? Now, this high school is fairly isolated in the community. So, or the community that it's in is, is rather isolated, I should say. They're about a mile from the nearest big city. There aren't a lot of other towns around. So a lot of the relationships that are happening are happening within the school. Um, and according to the researchers, this is a school where there's not a whole lot else going on. And so, uh, 
sex is a big way that the teenagers are passing time. They drive around, they go out to fields, they drink. This is all what the high schoolers told them. And so what you see here is obviously what's most eye-catching is this huge network where perhaps if you look at just, you know, one person in this network, they might not have slept with that many people, right? So this person here has slept with three people or has had a romantic relationship with three people. But those people connect that one person to this bigger network, okay? All these other ones are, are more fairly isolated social networks, right? Even though you have a high rate of activity or relationship, right, with this person having one, two, three, four, five, six romantic or sexual relationships, this person having one, two, three, four, five romantic or sexual relationships, these are somewhat larger than the rest of these um, smaller networks, right? So you have here um, a network where one female has had a relationship with three other, um, three male students. And this two here notes that there are two instances of this particular structure. Here you have instances where one person has had a relationship with two people of the opposite sex, 12 times for a male student having a relationship with two other female students, but nobody else. And those female students have had a relationship with nobody else. And then you have 63 instances where it's just two people in a relationship and they have not had a relationship with anybody else in that school during the study time. So this isn't, they're answering questions about the last 18 months. And you have a variety of other different sort of configurations of romantic and sexual relationships here. So what's interesting about this from a health perspective is that this visualization would really help if, for example, somebody, there was an outbreak of a sexually transmitted infection in the high school. If you had an idea of who was infected and you had an idea of what the sexual or romantic relationship network looked like, that might be super helpful when it comes to intervention. So, for example, you can imagine that the approach that you would take to intervention would look different if one of these people had a sexually transmitted infection compared to somebody in this network compared to this person in this larger network, the spread of that infection is going to look a lot different depending on what kind of sexual network you're dealing with. And so if the school, for example, had an idea, now not that schools would go and ask their students who they're having sex with. This was a very... Um, confidentiality protected study. The names of the students were never released, obviously. But if you had an idea of what that network looked like, intervention would be a lot easier. And this is sort of what um, the epidemiologists did when they went to Indiana for the HIV outbreak. This is another network. This is a school friendship network. So what you can see here, what's pretty obvious, is that you've got four sort of clusters of students. So this is, again, in a high school, four clusters of students that the network as a whole, indicate the network as a whole, is segregated by both grade and by race. So if you look at the top here, this is middle school students, okay? And down here are high school students in the high school that's connected to the middle school, right? That's in the same district as the middle school. They're also, the network is also segregated by race. So you have yellow dots indicating white students, green dots indicating African-American students, red dots indicating students of another race or ethnicity. What this network shows us, first of all, is this tendency towards what's called homophily. H-O-M-O-P-H-I-L-Y, homophily. Homophily means that we tend to um, associate with people who are a lot like us, whether that means by race, by age, by social class, we tend to form relationships with people who are like us. The more we do that, the more homophilous our networks are, okay? Now, you'll see if you look closely, and I'll show you a zoom in here, that the relationships, the ties between the nodes 
are directed, right? They have arrows. So you can see if you look, for example, here in this blue circle, you can see the two yellow nodes, right? Two white students have named each other as friends, okay? But the one student in this blue circle who is of another race or ethnicity, the red dot, that person was nominated as a friend by the white student in the middle, but did not reciprocate that nomination. In fact, the student the, in the red of another race or ethnicity did not nominate any, but said they did not have any friends at that school. If you look at the green dot, that person nominated the white student in the middle there, but the white student did not reciprocate that nomination. So you can see that these friendship ties are not necessarily Im implied or assumed to be reciprocal. The researchers asked people in the school, who are your friends? Who do you consider to be a friend? And asked the other students, who do you consider to be a friend? So it was always a one-way thing where in some cases that would be reciprocated by the other person. Okay, so you can see too where you can visualize popularity and social isolation in a visualization of a network. So, for example, this purple here, in this purple uh, graph, or sorry, in this purple circle, you can see this one white student who has a lot of arrows pointing at them. This means that there are a lot of students in the high school and in the middle school, because they're sort of in the middle, a lot of students who nominated this person as their friend. So that person is particularly pop popular. And you'll note if we look at isolation, there are a couple dots over here on the left side that have no ties to or from them in any way. These are what we would call social isolates. And what we know from research is that being isolated from a social network can have really damaging effects on your health. We as humans crave social belonging, and so to be isolated from a network is often seen as a really strong predictor of poor health, particularly mental health, but also physical health. Okay, so you see a couple of students here. Now, it's possible that those students just aren't friends with anybody in their school. They might be friends with students from somewhere else. But nonetheless, they are isolated completely from this particular social network. Okay. We can also think about um, what we would call the core of the network versus the periphery of the network, right? So the middle. So if you talk about core versus periphery, this is the core, right? The people who are in the middle are going to be the most connected. As you move outside of the social network drawing, you can see that these students are much more on the periphery. A lot of them look like they have nominations to them, right? Here, all of these here, nominations to them here, over here, nominations to, but are not nominating anybody in the network as friends. So they essentially have one person linking them to that network. That's a very fragile place to be. The other thing that social networks can show us is how ties can bond people who are similar to one another, right? So that's when you would see um, relationships between people of a similar race or grade, for example. And we can see ties that bridge people who are of different social groups together. So, for example, this tie here might be a bridging tie. This tie over here might be a bridging tie. It's a little harder to see in the middle of the graph. Um, but bonding ties bring people together who are of similar characteristics. Bridging ties bring people together who have different characteristics. So to sum up, the tie between two people represents some kind of social relationship. And research su suggests that these relationships are so important for health. Mapping them out in networks like this allows us to consider the impact of more than one relationship at a time. So we're looking at the entire network, and it turns out that the properties of that entire network are also important for our health. It's not just our one-on-one -on -one relationships, but what do we know about that network as a whole? And it helps us acknowledge that social relationships occur in a broader context. So next up, we're going to talk about how it is that social relationships 
impact our health.